Part 2 of Bat Wing by Sax Romer. Read by Mark Nelson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bat Wing, Chapter 4 Cray's Folly. Paul Harley lay back upon the cushions and glanced at me with a quizzical smile. The big, up-to-date car which Colonel Menendez had placed at our disposal was surmounting a steep Surrey lane as though no gradient had existed. "'Some engine,' he said approvingly. I nodded in agreement but felt disinclined for conversation, being absorbed in watching the characteristically English scenery. This indeed was very beautiful. The lane along which we were speeding was narrow, winding, and overarched by trees. Here and there sunlight penetrated to spread a golden carpet before us, but for the most part the way lay in cool and grateful shadow. On one side a wooded slope hemmed us in blackly, on the other lay dell after dell down into the cradle of the valley. It was a poetic corner of England, and I thought it almost unbelievable that London was only some twenty miles behind. A fit place this for elves and fairies to survive a spot in which the presence of a modern automobile seemed a desecration. Higher we mounted and higher, the engine running strongly and smoothly. Then presently we were out upon a narrow open road with a crescent of the hill sweeping away on the right and dense woods dipping valleyward to the left and behind us. The chauffeur turned and meeting my glance, "'Cray's folly, sir,' he said. He jerked his hand in the direction of a square, gray stone tower, somewhat resembling a campanile, which uprose from a distant clump of woods cresting a greater eminence. Ah, murmured Harley, the famous tower. Following the departure of the colonel on the previous evening, he had looked up Cray's Folly and had found it to be one of a series of houses erected by the eccentric and wealthy man whose name it bore. He had had a mania for building houses with towers in which his rival, and contemporary, had been William Beckford, the author of Vathic, a work which for some obscure reason has survived as well as two of the three towers erected by its writer. I became conscious of a keen sense of anticipation. In this, I think, the figure of Miss Val Berkeley played a leading part. There was something pathetic in the presence of this lonely English girl in so singular a household for if the menage at Cray's Folly should prove half so strange as Colonel Menendez had led us to believe, then truly we were about to find ourselves amid unusual people. Presently the road inclined southward somewhat and we entered the fringe of the trees. I noticed one or two very ancient cottages, but no trace of the modern builder. This was a fragment of real old England, and I was not sorry when presently we lost sight of the square tower for amidst such scenery it was an anomaly and a rebuke. What Paul Harley's thoughts may have been I cannot say, but he preserved an unbroken silence up to the very moment that we came to the gate-lodge. The gates were monstrosities of elaborate iron scrollwork, craftsmanship clever enough in its way, but of an ornate kind more in keeping with the orange trees of the south than with this wooded Surrey countryside. A very surly-looking girl, quite obviously un-English, a daughter of Pedro the butler I learned later, opened the gates and we entered upon a winding drive literally tunneled through the trees. Of the house we had never a glimpse until we were right under its walls, nor should I have known that we were come to the main entrance if the car had not stopped. "'Looks like a monastery,' muttered Harley. Indeed, that part of the building, the north front, which was visible from this point had a strangely monastic appearance, being built of solid gray blocks and boasting only a few small heavily barred windows. The eccentricity of the Victorian gentleman who had expended thousands of pounds upon erecting this house was only equaled, I thought, by that of Colonel Menendez, who had chosen it for a home. An outjutting wing shut us in on the west and to the east the prospect was closed by the tallest and most densely grown box-hedge I had ever seen, trimmed most perfectly and having an arched opening in the center. Thus the entrance to Cray's Folly lay in a sort of bay. But even as we stepped from the car the great church-like oaken doors were thrown open, and there, framed in the monkish porch, stood the tall, elegant figure of the colonel. "'Gentlemen!' he cried, 
Welcome to Cray's Folly. He advanced, smiling, and in the bright sunlight seemed even more Mephistophelian than he had seemed in Harley's office. Pedro, he called, and a strange-looking Spanish butler who wore his side-whiskers like a bullfighter appeared behind his master, a sallow, furtive fellow with whom I determined I should never feel at ease. However, the colonel greeted us heartily enough and conducted us through a kind of paved, covered courtyard into a great lofty hall. Indeed, it more closely resembled a studio, being partly lighted by a most curious dome. It was furnished in a manner quite un-English, but very luxuriously. A magnificent oaken staircase communicated with a gallery on the left, and at the foot of this staircase, in a mechanical chair, which he managed with astonishing dexterity, sat Madame de Stamer. She had snow-white hair crowning the face of a comparatively young woman, and large, dark brown eyes which reminded me strangely of the eyes of some animal, although in the first moment of meeting I could not identify the resemblance. Her hands were very slender and beautiful, and when, as the colonel presented us, she extended her fingers, I was not surprised to see Harley stoop and kiss them in continental fashion, for this Madam evidently expected. I followed suit, but truth to tell, after that first glance at the masterful figure in the invalid chair, I had had no eyes for Madame de Stamer, being fully employed in gazing at someone who stood beside her. This was an evasively pretty girl, or such was my first impression. That is to say, that whilst her attractiveness was beyond dispute, analysis of her small features failed to detect from which particular quality this charm was derived. The contour of her face certainly formed a delightful oval, and there was a wistful look in her eyes which was half appealing and half impish. Her demure expression was not convincing, and there rested a vague smile, or promise of a smile, upon lips which were perfectly moulded, and indeed the only strictly regular feature of a nevertheless bewitching face. She had slightly curling hair, and the line of her neck and shoulder was most graceful and charming. Of one thing I was sure. She was glad to see visitors at Cray's Folly. "'And now, gentlemen,' said Colonel Menendez, "'having presented you to Madame, my cousin, permit me to present to you Miss Val Beverly, my cousin's companion and our very dear friend.' The girl bowed in a formal English fashion, which contrasted sharply with the continental manner of Madame. Her face flushed slightly, and as I met her glance she lowered her eyes. "'Now, Monsieur Harley and Monsieur Knox,' said Madame vivaciously, "'you are quite at home. Pedro will show you to your rooms, and lunch will be ready in half an hour.' She waved her white hand coquettishly, and, ignoring the proffered aid of Miss Beverly, wheeled her chair away at a great rate under a sort of arch on the right of the hall, which communicated with the domestic offices of the establishment. "'Is she not wonderful?' exclaimed Colonel Menendez, taking Harley's left arm and my right and guiding us upstairs, followed by Pedro and the chauffeur, the latter carrying our grips. "'Many women would be prostrated by such an affliction, but she—' he shrugged his shoulders. Harley and I had been placed in adjoining rooms. I had never seen such rooms as those in Cray's Folly. The place contained enough oak to have driven a modern builder crazy. Oak had simply been lavished upon it. My own room, which was almost directly above the box hedge to which I have referred, had a beautiful carved ceiling and a floor as highly polished as that of a ballroom. It was tastefully furnished, but the foreign note was perceptible everywhere. We have here some grand prospects," said the colonel, and truly enough the view from the great high wide window was a very fine one. I perceived that the grounds of Cray's Folly were extensive and carefully cultivated. I had a glimpse of a Tudor sunken garden, but the best view of this was from the window of Harley's room, which, because it was the end room on the north front, overlooked another part of the grounds and offered a prospect of the east lawns and distant parkland. When presently Colonel Menendez and I accompanied my friend, there I was, charmed by the picturesque scene below. 
There was a real old herbal garden, gay with flowers and intersected by tiled moss-grown paths. There were bushes exhibiting fantastic examples of the topiary art, and here too was a sundial. My first impression of this beautiful spot was one of delight. Later I was to regard that enchanted domain with something akin to horror. But as we stood there watching a gardener clipping the bushes, I thought that, although Cray's folly might be adjudged ugly, its grounds were delightful. Suddenly Harley turned to our host. "'Where is the famous tower?' he inquired. "'It is not visible from the front of the house, nor from the drive.' "'No, no,' replied the colonel. "'It is right out at the end of the east wing, which is disused. I keep it locked up. There are four rooms in the tower, and a staircase, of course, but it is inconvenient. I cannot imagine why it was built." "'The architect may have had some definite object in view,' said Harley, "'or it may have been merely a freak of his client. Is there anything characteristic about the topmost room, for instance?' Colonel Menendez shrugged his massive shoulders. "'Nothing,' he replied. "'It is the same as the others below, except there is a stair leading to a gallery on the roof. Presently I will take you up, if you wish." "'I should be interested,' murmured Harley, and tactfully changed the subject, which evidently was not altogether pleasing to our host. I concluded that he had found the east wing of the house something of a white elephant, and was accordingly sensitive upon the point. Presently, then, he left us, and I returned to my own room, but before long I rejoined Harley. I did not knock, but entered unceremoniously. "'Hello!' I exclaimed. "'What have you seen?' He was standing, staring out of the window, nor did he turn as I entered. "'What is it?' I said, joining him. He glanced at me oddly. "'An impression,' he replied. "'But it has gone now.' "'I understand,' I said quietly. Familiarity with crime in many guises and under many skies had developed in Paul Harley a sort of sixth sense. It was a fugitive, fickle thing, as are all the powers which belong to the realm of genius or inspiration. Often enough it failed him entirely, he had assured me, that odd, sudden chill, as of an abrupt lowering of the temperature which, I understood, often advised him of the nearness of enmity actively malignant. Now, standing at the window, looking down at that old-world garden, he was sensing the atmosphere keenly, seeking for the note of danger. It was sheer intuition, perhaps, but whilst he could never rely upon it answering his summons, once active, it never misled him. "'You think some real menace overhangs, Colonel Menendez?' I am sure of it," he stared into my face. There is something very, very strange about this bat-wing business. Do you still incline to the idea that he has been followed to England? Paul Harley reflected for a moment, then— That explanation would be almost too simple, he said. There is something bizarre, something unclean, I had almost said unholy, at work in this house, Knox. He has foreign servants. Harley shook his head. "'I shall make it my business to become acquainted with all of them,' he replied. "'But the danger does not come from there. Let's go down to lunch.'" Chapter 5 Val Beverly The luncheon was so good as to be almost ostentatious. One could not have lunched better at the Carlton. Yet, since this luxurious living was evidently customary in the colonel's household, a charge of ostentation would not have been deserved. The sinister-looking Pedro proved to be an excellent servant, and because of the excitement of feeling myself to stand upon the edge of unusual things, the enjoyment of a perfectly served repast, and the sheer delight which I experienced in watching the play of expression upon the face of Miss Beverley, I count that luncheon at Cray's Folly a memorable hour of my life. Frankly, Val Beverley puzzled me. It may or may not have been curious that amidst such singular company I selected for my especial study a girl so freshly and typically English. 
I had thought, at the moment of meeting her, that she was provokingly pretty. I determined, as the lunch proceeded, that she was beautiful. Once I caught Harley smiling at me in his quizzical fashion, and I wondered guiltily if I were displaying an undue interest in the companion of Madame. Many topics were discussed, I remember, and beyond doubt the Colonel's cousin housekeeper dominated the debate. She possessed extraordinary force of personality. Her English was not nearly so fluent as that spoken by the Colonel, but this handicap only served to emphasize the masculine strength of her intellect. Truly, she was a remarkable woman. With her blanched hair and her young face, and those fine, velvety eyes which possessed a quality almost hypnotic, she might have posed for the figure of a sorceress. She had unfamiliar gestures and employed her long white hands in a manner that was new to me and utterly strange. I could detect no family resemblance between the cousins, and I wondered if their kinship were very distant. One thing was evident enough, Madame de Stemmer was devoted to the Colonel. Her expression when she looked at him changed entirely. For a woman of such intense vitality her eyes were uncannily still. This is to say that while she frequently moved her head she rarely moved her eyes. Again and again I found myself wondering where I had seen such eyes before. I live to identify that memory, as I shall presently relate. In vain I endeavored to define the relationship between these three people, so incongruously set beneath one roof. Of the fact that Miss Beverley was not happy I became assured but respecting her exact position in the household I was reduced to surmises. The colonel improved on acquaintance. I decided that he belonged to an order of Spanish grandees now almost extinct. I believed he would have made a very staunch friend. I felt sure he would have proved a most implacable enemy. Altogether it was a memorable meal and one notable result of that brief companionship was a kind of link of understanding between myself and Miss Beverley. Once, when I had been studying Madame de Stemmer, and again as I removed my glance from the dark face of Colonel Menendez, I detected the girl watching me, and her eyes said, You understand, so do I. Some things, perhaps, I did understand, but how few the near future was to show. The signal for our departure from table was given by Madame de Stemmer. She whisked her chair back with extraordinary rapidity, the contrast between her swift, nervous movements and those still, basilisk eyes being almost uncanny. "'Off you go, Juan,' she said. "'Your visitors would like to see the garden, no doubt. I must be away for my afternoon siesta. Come, my dear,' to the girl, "'smoke one little cigarette with me, then I will let you go.' She retired, wheeling herself rapidly out of the room, and my glance lingered upon the graceful figure of Val Beverly until both she and Madame were out of sight. "'Now, gentlemen,' said the Colonel, resuming his seat and pushing the decanter toward Paul Harley, "'I am at your service, either for business or amusement. To think,' to Harley, "'you expressed a desire to see the tower?' "'I did.' my friend replied, lighting his cigar, but only if it would amuse you to show me. Decidedly. Mr. Knox, will you join us? Harley, unseen by the colonel, glanced at me in a way which I knew. Thanks all the same, I said, smiling, but following a perfect luncheon I should much prefer to loll upon the lawn if you don't mind. But certainly I do not mind, cried the colonel. I wish you to be happy. "'Join you in a few minutes, Knox,' said Harley, as he went out with our host. "'All right,' I replied. "'I should like to take a stroll around the gardens. You will join me there later, no doubt?' As I walked out into the bright sunshine I wondered why Paul Harley had wished to be left alone with Colonel Menendez, but knowing that I should learn his motive later I strolled on through the gardens, my mind filled with speculations respecting these unusual people with whom fate had brought me in contact. I felt that Miss Beverley needed protection of some kind, and I was conscious of a keen desire to afford her that protection. In her glance I had read, or thought I had read, an appeal for sympathy. 
Not the least mystery of Cray's folly was the presence of this girl. Only toward the end of luncheon had I made up my mind upon a point which had been puzzling me. Val Beverly's gaiety was a cloak. Once I had detected her watching Madame de Stemmer with a look strangely like that of fear. Puffing contentedly at my cigar, I proceeded to make a tour of the house. It was constructed irregularly. Practically the entire building was of grey stone, which created a depressing effect even in the blazing sunlight, lending Cray's folly something of an austere aspect. There were fine lofty windows, however, to most of the ground-floor rooms overlooking the lawns, and some of those above had balconies of the same grey stone. Quite an extensive kitchen garden and a line of glass-houses adjoined the west wing, and here were outbuildings, coach-houses, and a garage, all connected by a covered passage with the servants' quarters. Pursuing my inquiries, I proceeded to the north front of the building, which was closely hemmed in by trees, and which, as we had observed on our arrival, resembled the entrance to a monastery. Passing the massive oaken door by which we had entered, and which was now closed again, I walked on through the opening in the box hedge into a part of the grounds which was not so sprucely groomed as the rest. On one side were the yews flanking the Tudor garden, and before me uprose the famous tower. As I stared up at the square structure with its uncurtained windows, I wondered, as others had wondered before me, what could have ever possessed any man to build it. Visible at points for many miles around, it undoubtedly disfigured an otherwise beautiful landscape. I pressed on, noting that the windows of the rooms in the east wing were shuttered and the apartments evidently disused. I came to the base of the tower. To the south the country rose up to the highest point in the crescent of hills, and peeping above the trees at no great distance away I detected the red brick chimneys of some old house in the woods. North and east, velvet sward swept down to the park. As I stood there admiring the prospect, and telling myself that no voodoo devilry could find a home in this peaceful English countryside, I detected a faint sound of voices far above. Someone had evidently come out upon the gallery of the tower. I looked upward, but I could not see the speakers. I pursued my stroll, until, near the eastern base of the tower, I encountered a perfect thicket of rhododendrons. Finding no path through this shrubbery, I retraced my steps, presently entering the Tudor garden, and there, strolling toward me, a book in her hand, was Miss Beverley. "'Hello, Mr. Knox,' she called. "'I thought you had gone up the tower.' "'No,' I replied, laughing. "'I lack the energy.' "'Do you?' she said softly. Then sit down and talk to me." She dropped down upon a grassy bank, looking up at me invitingly, and I accepted the invitation without demur. "'I love this old garden,' she declared, although, of course, it is really no older than the rest of the place. I always think there should be peacocks, though." "'Yes,' I agreed. "'Peacocks would be appropriate.' "'And little pages dressed in yellow velvet. She met my glance soberly for a moment and then burst into a peal of merry laughter. "'Do you know, Miss Beverley,' I said, watching her, "'I find it hard to place you in the household of the Colonel.' "'Yes,' she said simply, "'you must.' "'Oh, then you realize that you are out of place here?' "'Quite.' "'Of course I am.' She smiled, shook her head, and changed the subject. I'm so glad Mr. Paul Harley has come down," she confessed. You know my friend by name, then? Yes, she replied. Someone I met in Nice spoke of him, and I know he is very clever. In Nice? Did you live in Nice before you came here? Val Beverly nodded slowly, and her glance grew oddly retrospective. I lived for over a year with Madame de Stemmer in a little villa on the Promenade des Anglaises, she replied. That was after Madame was injured. She sustained her injuries during the war, I understand. Yes, poor Madame. The hospital of which she was in charge was bombed, and the shock left her as you see her. I was there, too, but I luckily escaped without injury. What, you were there? Yes, 
That was where I first met Madame de Stemmer. She used to be very wealthy, you see, and she established this hospital in France at her own expense, and I was one of her assistants for a time. She lost both her husband and her fortune in the war, and as if that were not bad enough, lost the use of her limbs, too. Poor woman, I said. I had no idea her life had been so tragic. She has wonderful courage. Courage, exclaimed the girl, if you knew all that I know about her. Her face grew sweetly animated as she bent toward me excitedly and confidentially. Really, she is simply wonderful. I learned to respect her in those days as I have never respected any other woman in the world and when, after all her splendid work, she, so vital and active, was stricken down like that, I felt that I simply could not leave her, especially as she asked me to stay. So you went with her to Nice? Yes. Then the Colonel took this house and we came here. But— She hesitated and glanced at me curiously. Perhaps you are not quite happy? No, she said, I am not. You see, it was different in France. I knew so many people, but here at Cray's Folly it is so lonely, and Madame is—' Again she hesitated. "'Yes?' "'Well,' she laughed in an embarrassed fashion, "'I'm afraid of her at times.' "'In what way?' "'Oh, in a silly, womanish sort of way. Of course she is a wonderful manager. She rules the house with a rod of iron. But really, I haven't anything to do here, and I feel frightfully out of place sometimes. Then the Colonel—oh, but what am I talking about? Won't you tell me what it is that the Colonel fears? You know that he fears something, then? Of course. That is why Paul Harley is here. A change came over the girl's face, a look almost of dread. I wish I knew what it all meant. You are aware, then, that there is something wrong? Naturally I am. Sometimes I have been so frightened that I have made up my mind to leave the very next day." "'You mean that you have been frightened at night?' I asked with curiosity. "'Dreadfully frightened.' "'Won't you tell me in what way?' She looked up at me swiftly, then turned her head aside and bit her lip. "'No, not now,' she replied. I can't very well. Then at least tell me why you stayed." Well, she smiled rather pathetically, for one thing, I haven't anywhere else to go. Have you no friends in England? She shook her head. No, there was only poor Daddy, and he died over two years ago. That was when I went to Nice. Poor little girl, I said and the words were spoken before I realized their undue familiarity. An apology was on the tip of my tongue, but Miss Beverly did not seem to have noticed the indiscretion. Indeed, my sympathy was sincere, and I think she had appreciated the fact. She looked up again with a bright smile. "'Why are we talking about such depressing things on this simply heavenly day?' she exclaimed. "'Goodness knows,' said I. "'Will you show me round these lovely gardens?' "'Delighted, sir,' replied the girl, rising and sweeping me a mocking curtsy. Thereupon we set out, and at every step I found a new delight in some wayward curl, in a gesture, in the sweet voice of my companion. Her merry laugh was music, but in wistful mood I think she was even more alluring. The menace, if menace there were, which overhung Cray's folly, ceased to exist, for me at least, and I blessed the lucky chance which had led me to my presence there. We were presently rejoined by Colonel Menendez and Paul Harley, and I gathered that my surmise that it had been their voices which I had heard proceeding from the top of the tower to have been only partly accurate. "'I know you will excuse me, Mr. Harley,' said the Colonel, "'for detailing the duty to Pedro, but my wind is not good enough for the stairs.' He used idiomatic English at times with that facility which some foreigners acquire, but always smiled in a self-satisfied way when he had employed a slang term. "'I quite understand, Colonel,' replied Harley. "'The view from the top was very fine, 
And now, gentlemen, continued the colonel, if Miss Beverly will excuse us, we will retire to the library and discuss business. As you wish, said Harley, but I have an idea that it is your custom to rest in the afternoon. Colonel Menendez shrugged his shoulders. It used to be, he admitted, but I have too much to think about in these days. I can see that you have much to tell me, admitted Harley, and therefore I am entirely at your service. Val Beverly smiled and walked away swinging her book, at the same time treating me to a glance which puzzled me considerably. I wondered if I had mistaken its significance, for it had seemed to imply that she had accepted me as an ally. Certainly it served to awaken me to the fact that I had discovered a keen personal interest in the mystery, which hung over this queerly assorted household. I glanced at my friend as the colonel led the way into the house. I saw him staring upward with a peculiar expression upon his face, and following the direction of his glance I could see an awning spread over one of the grey stone balconies. Beneath it, reclining in a long cane chair, lay Madame de Stemmer. I think she was asleep. At any rate, she gave no sign, but lay there motionless, as Harley and I walked in through the open French windows, followed by Colonel Menendez. Odd and unimportant details sometimes linger long in the memory, and I remember noticing that a needle of sunlight piercing a crack in the gaily striped awning rested upon a ring which Madame wore, so that the diamonds glittered like sparks of white-hot fire. Chapter 6 The Barrier Colonel Menendez conducted us to a long, lofty library, in which might be detected the same note of un-English luxury manifested in the other appointments of the house. The room, in common with every other room which I had visited in Cray's Folly, was carried out in oak, doors, window frames, mantelpiece, and ceiling representing fine examples of this massive woodwork. Indeed, if the eccentricity of the designer of Cray's Folly were not sufficiently demonstrated by the peculiar plan of the building, its construction, wholly of granite and oak, must have remarked him a man of unusual, if substantial, ideas. There were four long windows opening onto a veranda, which commanded a view of part of the rose garden and of three terraced lawns descending to a lake upon which I perceived a number of swans. Beyond, in the valley, lay verdant pastures, where cattle grazed. A lark hung caroling blithely far above, and the sky was almost cloudless. I could hear a steam reaper at work somewhere in the distance. This, along with the more intimate rattle of a lawnmower wielded by a gardener who was not visible from where I stood, alone disturbed the serene silence, except that presently I detected the droning of many bees among the roses. Sunlight flooded the prospect, but the veranda lay in shadow, and that long oaken room was refreshingly cool and laden with the heavy perfume of the flowers. From the windows, then, one beheld a typical English summerscape, but the library itself struck an altogether more exotic note. There were many glazed bookcases of garish design in ebony and gilt, and these were laden with a vast collection of works in almost every European language reflecting perhaps the cosmopolitan character of the colonel's household. There was strange Spanish furniture upholstered in perforated leather and again displaying much gilt. There were suits of black armor and a great number of Moorish ornaments. The pictures were fine but somber, and all of the Spanish school. One Velasquez in particular I noted with surprise, reflecting that, assuming it to be an authentic work of the master, my entire worldly possessions could not have enabled me to buy it. It was the portrait of a typical Spanish cavalier, and beyond doubt a Menendez. In fact, the resemblance between the haughty Spanish grandee, who seemed about to step out of the canvas and pick a quarrel with the spectator, and Colonel Don Juan himself was almost startling. Evidently, our host had imported most of his belongings from Cuba. "'Gentlemen,' he said as we entered, "'make yourselves quite at home, I beg. All my poor establishment contains is for your entertainment and service.' He drew up two long, low lounge chairs, the arms provided with receptacles to contain cooling drinks, 
and the mere sight of these chairs mentally translated me to the Spanish main, where I pictured them set upon the veranda of that hacienda which had formerly been our host's residence. Harley and I became seated, and Colonel Menendez disposed himself upon a leather-covered couch, nodding apologetically as he did so. "'My health requires that I should recline for a certain number of hours every day,' he explained. "'So you will please forgive me.' "'My dear Colonel Menendez,' said Harley, "'I feel sure that you are interrupting your siesta in order to discuss the unpleasant business which finds us in such pleasant surroundings. Allow me once again to suggest that we postpone this matter until, shall we say, after dinner?' "'No, no, no, no!' protested the colonel, waving his hand deprecatingly. Here is Pedro with coffee and some curacao of a kind which I can really recommend, although you may be unfamiliar with it. I was certainly unfamiliar with the liqueur which he insisted we must taste, and which was contained in a sort of square, opaque bottle, unknown, I think, to English wine merchants. Beyond doubt it was potent stuff and some cigars which the Spaniard produced on this occasion, and which were enclosed in little glass cylinders resembling test-tubes and elaborately sealed, I recognized to be priceless. They convinced me, if conviction had not visited me already, that Colonel Don Juan Sarmiento Menendez belonged to that old school of West Indian planters by whom the tradition of the Golden Americas had been for long preserved in the Spanish main. We discussed indifferent matters for a while, sipping this wonderful curacao of our hosts. The effect created by the colonel's story faded entirely, and when, the latter being unable to conceal his drowsiness, Harley stood up, I took the hint with gratitude, for at that moment I did not feel in the mood to discuss serious business, or indeed business of any kind. "'Gentlemen,' said the colonel, also rising, in spite of our protests, I will observe your wishes. My guest's wishes are mine. We will meet the ladies for tea on the terrace." Harley and I walked out into the garden together, our courteous host standing in the open window, and bowing in that exaggerated fashion which, in another, might have been ridiculous, but which was possible in Colonel Menendez, because of the peculiar grace of deportment which was his. As we descended the steps I turned and glanced back. I know not why. But the impression which I derived of the colonel's face as he stood there in the shadow of the veranda was one I can never forget. His expression had changed utterly, or so it seemed to me. He no longer resembled Velasquez's haughty cavalier. Gone, too, was the debonair bearing. I turned my head aside swiftly, hoping that he had not detected my backward glance. I felt that I had violated hospitality. I felt that I had seen what I should not have seen, and the result was to bring about that which no story of West Indian magic could ever have wrought in my mind. A dreadful, cold premonition claimed me, a premonition that this was a doomed man. The look which I had detected upon his face was an undefinable and indescribable look, but I had seen it in the eyes of one who had been bitten by a poisonous reptile and knew his hours to be numbered. It was uncanny, unnerving, and whereas at first the atmosphere of Colonel Menendez's home had seemed to be laden with prosperous security, now that sense of ease and restfulness was gone, and gone forever. Harley, I said, speaking almost at random, this promises to be the strangest case you have ever handled. Promises? Paul Harley laughed shortly. It is the strangest case, Knox. It is a case of wheels within wheels, of mystery crowning mystery. Have you studied our host? Closely. And what conclusion have you formed? Not at the moment, but I think one is slowly crystallizing." "'Hm,' muttered Harley, as we paced slowly on amid the rose-trees. Of one thing I am satisfied. What is that? that Colonel Menendez is not afraid of Batwing, whoever or whatever Batwing may be. Not afraid? Certainly he is not afraid, Knox. He has possibly been afraid in the past, but now he is resigned. Resigned to what? 
resign to death. Good God, Harley, you are right, I cried. You are right. I saw it in his eyes as we left the library. Harley stopped and turned to me sharply. You saw this in the Colonel's eyes, he challenged. I did. Which corroborates my theory, he said softly, for I had seen it elsewhere. Where do you mean, Harley? In the face of Madame de Stemmer. What? Knox! Harley rested his hand upon my arm and looked about him cautiously. She knows. But knows what? That is the question which we are here to answer, but I am as sure as it is humanly possible to be sure of anything that whatever Colonel Menendez may tell us tonight, one point at least he will withhold. What do you expect him to withhold? The meaning of the sign of the bat-wing. Then you think he knows its meaning? He has told us that it is the death-token of voodoo. I stared at Harley in perplexity. Then you believe his explanation to be false? Not necessarily, Knox. It may be what he claims for it, but he is keeping something back. He speaks all the time from behind a barrier, which he himself has deliberately erected against me. I cannot understand why he should do so, I declared, as he looked at me steadily. Within the last few moments I have become definitely convinced that his appeal to you was no idle one. Therefore, why should he not offer you every aid in his power?" "'Why, indeed,' muttered Harley. "'The same thing,' I continued, "'applies to Madame de Stemmer. If ever I have seen love-light in a woman's eyes, I have seen it in hers, today, whenever her glance has rested upon Colonel Menendez. Harley, I believe she literally worships the ground he walks upon.' "'She does, she does,' cried my companion and emphasized the words with beats of his clenched fist. It is utterly, damnably mystifying. But I tell you, she knows, Knox, she knows. You mean she knows that he is a doomed man? Harley nodded rapidly. They both know, he replied, but there is something which they dare not divulge. He glanced at me swiftly, and his bronzed face wore a peculiar expression. Have you had an opportunity of any private conversation with Miss Val Beverly? he inquired. Yes, I said. Surely you remember that you found me chatting with her when you returned from your inspection of the tower. I remember perfectly well, but I thought you might have just met. Now it appears to me, Knox, that you have quickly established yourself in the good books of a very charming girl. My only reason for visiting the tower was to afford you just this opportunity. Don't frown, beyond reminding you of the fact that she has been on intimate terms with Madame de Stemmer for some years, I will not intrude in any way upon your private plans in that direction." I stared at him, and I suppose my expression was an angry one. "'Surely you don't misunderstand me,' he said. A cultured English girl of that type cannot possibly have lived with these people without learning something of the matters which are puzzling us so badly. Am I asking too much? I see what you mean," I said slowly. No, I suppose you are right, Harley. Good, he muttered. I will leave that side of the inquiry in your very capable hands, Knox. He paused and began to stare about him. From this point, he said, we have an unobstructed view of the tower. He turned and stood looking up at the unsightly gray structure, with its geometrical rows of windows and the minaret-like gallery at the top. Of course, I broke a silence of some moment's duration. The entire scheme of Cray's folly is peculiar, but the rooms, except for a uniformity which is monotonous and an unimaginative scheme of decoration which makes them all seem alike, are airy and well lighted, eminently sane and substantial. The tower, however, is quite inexcusable unless the idea was to enable the occupant to look over the tops of the trees in all directions." Yes, agreed Harley, it is an ugly landmark. But yonder up the slope I can see the corner of what seems to be a very picturesque house of some kind. I caught a glimpse of it earlier today, I replied. Yes, from this point a little more of it is visible. 
apparently quite an old place. I paused, staring up the hillside, but Harley, hands locked behind him and chin lowered reflectively, was pacing on. I joined him, and we proceeded for some little distance in silence, passing a gardener who touched his cap respectfully and to whom I thought at my first companion was about to address some remark. Harley passed on, however, still occupied, it seemed, with his reflections, and coming to a gravel path, which, bordering on one side of the lawns, led down from terrace to terrace into the valley, turned and began to descend. "'Let us go and interview the swans,' he murmured absently. End of Part Two